Madame Web, the 2024 movie review and thoughts. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I wanted to love, and there's definitely some stuff in it that I think is pretty good. But yeah, on the whole, I'm honestly, it's probably more than average than like just the worst thing ever. There's a couple of things in it that are definitely terrible, but on the whole, yeah, just, just kind of boring. And this video will have some jokes, none at the expense of members of minorities, and we'll get into some serious topics. And let's see. Yes, I realize this is a long, but I can't make it worth your time. The yeah, the first chunk of this video is going to be a review. I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything about this movie in that. If I decide over the course of it that I want to spoil something, I'm going to verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. If, you know, I might lift my finger at other points. If I don't also verbally warn, then it's not for spoiler. And, uh, I might, I might spoil, you know, I, I'm not 100% certain if this is supposed to be, it probably is supposed to be in continuity with the two Venom movies and the Morbius movie and probably also Craven, which, you know, I believe was supposed to have come out before this one did. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And as soon as I review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So this movie is rated PG-13. I don't mind, you know, a lot, a lot of these movies are PG-13. A lot of these, you know, comic book adaptations, you know, type of movie I, I largely love. I love most of these. It did feel a little bit like there were parts, you know... There are times in this movie where they'll, like, it's pretty obvious, okay, they kind of just want to use the F word, which, yeah, I don't think it was used even once in this, even though that is, like, by today's standards, you can actually, yeah, you know, at, at one point they say fricking, and it just felt like, okay, that character would not censor, and and honestly, I feel like if, if you're not going to have the character I get not using the word, but have somebody else, like, you know, maybe if, yeah, as as the character is saying it, somebody else, like, covers their mouth, just, you know, yeah, some something like that. Like, I, I thought it was, I, I quite like the way that they censored the, the swearing in the second Hunger Games movies, which I appreciate they couldn't do that here, because in that it's the, you know, oh, we're watching a TV show, and the TV show is okay with showing teenagers murdering other teenagers, but not swearing, which sadly very accurate about, you know, the the how censorship often goes. Um but yeah, uh, yes, so PG-13, the MPA rated it PG-13 for violence, action, and language. The IMDb the Parents Guide rates sex, nudity, profanity, alcohol, drugs, and smoking as mild, violence and gore and frightening and intense scenes as moderate. And yeah, there's definitely some... Yeah. Some of the violence in this is just... Yeah, I, I don't think I want to give... Uh, you know what? I think... Yeah, the... Uh, yes. There is a non-zero amount of scenes in this movie where pregnant... Yeah, someone pregnant is, at the very least, threatened with violence. I suppose... Tell you what, if you want to know if the violence is carried out, the IMDb Parents Guide has it very far up in the... Yeah. 
So, yeah. Um, they'll, they'll do that. They'll put that in this movie. But they won't use an F-bomb. That's just wild. And it's one of those things, like... It's not even really necessary. Like, I... They could have easily rewritten it to where it didn't... Yeah, where, where that just wasn't the case. I suppose it's possible. I have to admit, I have not read very much. I'm, I'm not very familiar with Madame Webb or the, the other of, of these characters. It's possible that it's comic accurate. But, you know, the... I'm not going to make excuses for it. I haven't read the, the comics. So if it's in the comics, I'm not going to speak to that. But once it's in a movie, certainly, like, you're putting that image out there. Like, just, yeah. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong to put stuff like that in just any movie. I don't really think that a PG-13, you know, like, it's not really... It's not that the movie overall is just like this, ah, oh, you know, dark, d dreary, you know. This is not like Joker, for example, you know, so the, the you know, great movie. So, so yeah, it just, I, I'm going to move on. Let's see, the, yeah, that brings us... Right, uh, yeah, so I've watched this movie once I hit record on this video, basically as soon as I got home from the theater. And let's see... Yeah, so the plot... Yeah, Cassandra... Um, yeah, I'm going to use some of what IMDb has. Cassandra Webb is a New York City paramedic, and... Yeah, I uh, let's see. Yeah, she finds herself protecting some people from a from yeah from from danger. Let's go with with that. And the yeah, there we go. So this was written theoretically, by Matt Zazama, Burke Sharpless, Claire Parker, S.J. Clarkson, and Kareem Sanga. And I'm not particularly familiar with... Um, yeah, so Matt, in addition to this, wrote Morbius. So it's pretty wild that they... I mean, I guess... Yeah, I, I gotta just real quick, when was it that they, let's see, um, okay, apparently it was, uh, let's see, they began development in 2019, and... Yeah, they filmed it in mid July 2022. So yeah, I think maybe they just didn't realize how negatively received Morbius would be. Matt also wrote Power Rangers, Gods of Egypt, The Last Witch Hunter, and Dracula Untold. I haven't watched any of those, but I hear very negative things about them. And, yeah, uh, Burke Sharpless wrote all of those same movies with Matt. And, let's see. Oh, uh, that's right. Um, Claire Parker, one of the writers. This is her only screenplay. That's not, that's not amazing. Um, let's see, and, right, so S.J. Clarkson also directed, and, let's see, in addition to this, she wrote, um, oh, yeah, okay, I was a little confused. yeah, there's two shows that she wrote for that are called Mistresses, the, 
the British original 2008 to 2010, and I'm going to go ahead and guess American probably, it's a remake from 2013 to 2016. She wrote 16 episodes of the original and 52 of the, the remake. And in addition, she... Yeah, in addition to directing this, she directed the first two episodes of Jessica Jones. She directed, right, also the first two episodes of The Defenders. Yeah, uh, really big fan of those. I think this one, it was mostly just the, the script. And I'm also not sure, based on, you know, the stuff I'm familiar with that she's directed... I don't know if this was the right kind of thing for her to do. It's probably a bit special effects heavy and like, you know, it's supposed to be this big crowd pleasing blockbuster. And I love Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones is not really crowd pleasing. That's one of the things I love about it, uh, you know. One of the best things, live-action Marvel, is, in my opinion, Jessica Jones. And, yeah, I uh, honestly, yeah, if they if they ever made... I, I would watch a Jessica Jones movie made by her, uh, you know, but this... Oh, that's right, she also, she directed, let's see, season 4, episode 11 of Dexter, and season 6, episodes 2 and 5... Of Dexter and as far oh right and and season four episode four of Heroes season four episode sixteen of Heroes yeah she's you know she definitely has an ability to make these kind of like wild concepts really work at least on the small screen and the final writer. Karam Sangha, yeah, I, I've never even heard of... Okay, so, the yeah, the other things that they wrote... The Violent Heart, First Girl I Love, The Young Kislowski, Trigger Finger, Ashley Mason, and Stoner. And this is actually the... Let's see... This and Stoner are the only two things that Karam Sangha wrote and did not also direct. So that might also be, you know, maybe they're better at writing, yeah, to, to also, some something that they also end up directing. There's some, you know, writers who are just, yeah, they, they do a, a better job when the, yeah. Um... So, yeah, um, I do really appreciate this is definitely, like, you know, despite the fact that, you know, of the, let's see, so, okay, so it's, yeah, there's six writers total. Only two of them are, are women. Oh, hold, no, five, wow. Uh, yeah, five writers total. Two of them are women, and the director is also a woman, there definitely are some things here that are very much, you know, stuff that, that you know, young women think about that maybe young men don't as much. I don't know how much, it's, it's hard to say, a lot of the negative reviews I've read really don't bring up gender much at all. And the things that they point to as, as points of criticism are things that I think are qu quite accurate. You know, I mentioned the, the special effects, for example. You know, it's difficult to say. Certainly there are a lot of movies that get hated just because of, you know, minority representation. I think that the, the movie could have done a better job with these elements, but... Certainly, like, you know, the the dynamics, the group dynamics, I think, are fairly specific to them all being women. The, 
yeah, I already mentioned, you know, pregnancy and, and birth comes up. And yeah, like the, the, you know, this thing of psychic, you know, that is often thought of as a feminine kind of thing, you know, where, where a masculine thing might be more, more violent more aggressive where this is essentially intuition dial up to 11 you know so yeah i quite appreciate that element of it i definitely think that movies that don't at all do anything like that are significantly less interesting and yeah there's definitely like um i appreciate it that I don't know how much I want to give away, but let's just say there's at least one character in this that has po powers that are very reminiscent of Spider-Man, including walking on walls and the ceiling and such. And sometimes the camera, you know, so so yeah, we have the the famous thing of you know going from the from standing on the floor to to standing on the ceiling, and yeah, you know, we've seen that so many times by now. Maybe it was in part to, in a, you know, bid to, to make that interesting, and, or maybe they did already think it was cool, but in this, the camera will sometimes flip <clears throat> so that, you know, it's, 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 it's not like a point of view shot, but it does feel like, oh, it's, you know, we're, our perception of up and down is changing along with this character's perception of up and down that was an, a neat little thing there you know you know it's something I've, I've seen in video games I haven't seen it in that many movies you know in video games you almost kind of need to unless that's part of the bit unless it's you know oh let's make this puzzle really difficult by forcing the player to to not perceive you know but yeah uh, let's see there was this um, yeah, it's definitely been been chopped up. There are certain scenes that feel like that was probably significantly longer originally, and then a studio head went in and said, snip, snip, snip. This is, you know, we're losing the audience. Like, it's... There's probably some, some like, devastating test screenings that helped lead to, to certain things here. Um, yeah, it's set in... A, yeah, a good chunk of it is set in 2003. There is a reason for that, but I don't know that I would necessarily say that reason is good. I, I will get into it in the spoiler section, but it is a pretty significant spoiler. I think that might be... Right, right, yes. So what I wanted to say about, you know, 2003... They, they do a couple of music and, and a couple of needle drops, stuff that was big uh, around that time. You know, it's it's fine. I, I think there needs to just be made a list in Hollywood of all the people that are really, really good at picking needle drops for period piece stuff. And then, like, if you can't make it on that list... You know, at the very least, you have to reach out to one of these people because, like, James Gunn would have nailed this. You know, he really, yeah. And and I'm not saying that because he's a man, and and you know, S. J. Clarkson is a woman, but just, yeah, the the, yeah, that could definitely have been better. So the, the action scenes are pretty underwhelming. Like, I watched this in a very packed theater. There wasn't, like, so, sometimes when you watch something, you know, I would definitely say when I watched the most recent Mission Impossible, for example, and when I watched No Way Home, you know, like, you could feel the entire room, like, gasp at the big moments, and everybody laughed at the best of the jokes and stuff like that. And, you know... Mission Impossible probably has too many jokes. Probably kind of the MCU effect thing. Love most of the MCU. Some movies do not need MCU jokes. Moving on. 
that never happened with this one. There was no point, at, at no point in this. Like, we must have been 30 or 40 people in the room. There wasn't a single time where it just felt like, oh, everyone. Like, I'll admit, it made me crack up a couple of times, you know, but not that many people in the room were, were like, just laughing uproariously. And... Yeah, the action, it's just not that compelling. It it feels just like... Like you have these really cool powers at play, you know. So so yeah, this Spider-Man thing and this, this like... Yeah, precognition thing of being able to see something and then getting a chance to do something different, which, you know made me want to play one of the, you know, yeah, a, a Prince of Persia game made after the first three, pretty much all of them have, you know, something like, you know, but yeah, especially the Sands of Time ones, but that's, you know, that's like shooting fish in a barrel, there's no, it's not difficult to make me Jones for some, some Prince of Persia, and, and yeah, it, it is one of those things, like, There's, there's so many cool things you can do with it, you know, uh, I feel terrible, but honestly, not gonna lie, next, the Nicolas Cage movie actually does a better job with precognition in action scenes. As, as much as I deplore that movie, I have to admit that really is and and that's again you know i i don't because sj clark's an incredibly talented uh, woman you know i've i will be forever grateful for what she did for jessica jones you know those first two episodes really get the ball rolling and there's just there's so much yeah um i'm i'm just not sure that this it, I guess it's possible that it was the it was studio interference. It's entirely possible, but this really needed a, a firmer hand on the action scenes, and maybe she's capable of it, and just needs to be working for a studio that doesn't you know screw it up. But certainly, you know, at the end of the day, I can only judge the the end result, and this is just not super impressive. I think that might be about, yeah, um, so, ranking worst to best all live action Spider-Man movies and Spider-Man related movies, more, uh, ranking all except for this one. At the end of this review itself, I will update the list with the ranking for, with this in the rank, yes. Worst to best, Morbius, Venom, Spider-Man 3, Venom 2, Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 1, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, The Amazing Spider-Man 1, Homecoming, Far From Home, Spider-Verse 1, Spider-Verse 2, No Way Home, Civil War, Infinity War, and Endgame. And, yeah, honestly, it's too bad that this will probably have people claiming that it's a bad, you know, the, the chuds are going to come out in full force claiming it's a bad idea to make female-centered comic book movies just because this Catwoman and Wonder Woman 1984 are bad does not mean that women make bad comic book movies. You know, sure, these are, you know, three bad comic book movies, but the aspects that the women bring to it make it better, not worse. The bad stuff in... Uh, so yeah, in in every single female-centered comic book movie that I've personally watched, the bad stuff does not come from the the women and the the feminist elements. The Marvels is perfectly fine. The Black Widow solo movie gets really really close to being incredible. You know, a lot of the best stuff in those is related to the female characters. Wonder Woman 1, Captain Marvel 1, Birds of Prey, and Wakanda Forever are amazing movies, especially because 
of the women. Now, yeah, uh, others have already pointed out this movie, Madam Web, is too reminiscent of early 2000s comic book movies in all the worst ways. And yeah, that really is... Yeah, it's it's too bad. It's, you know, Sony keeps doing this with these, you know, Spider-Man-less Spider-Man movies. Right, others have pointed out there, there's a bit of Terminator going on here, which is kind of cool. The, um, there are also some vibes of Final Destination. And let's see. So I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but yeah, um, the ending does fit with what came before. I thought the ending was okay. Um, you know, by then I wasn't really super surprised that it wasn't much better than it was. And let's see. Right. Um, so, as mentioned, I haven't read a lot that had a, a lot of stories that have Madam Web. Um, one thing is, like, when you think of Madam Web, like, other than being that, that in the comics, it's all, you know, the character is also female, they really didn't keep very much at all. Like, in the comics, she's a senior freaking citizen, she is wheelchair bound, she's got, like, this, you know, thing covering her eyes, which. For for a while, that was a thing of like, oh, you know, this character's psychic. Just watch; you can cover their eyes, and they can see. So, you know, so yeah, the, the you know, the psychic powers and the fact that the character is female is pretty much all that they left intact. Which is just like, I'm not upset that we got another female-led comic book movie. I wish it was a lot better. But there's so many other female characters that you figure it would would make more sense. And you know, right before I, I started recording this, I watched the the video, which I'll link below. Nando V Movies talks about the the movie, and uh, you know, he he talks about how apparently one of the reasons, or maybe the main reason, for making a Madam Web movie was that they thought of, you know, Sony thought of this as like, oh, it's like Doctor Strange, you know, she opens up the multiverse. And it's like, I mean, I guess theoretically, but just, this is not that good of a way of, of handling that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's very, very... The movie struggles with being an origin story, and that's again one of those things like gotta make a short list of people who know how to make an origin story, because there's so many people who are willing to make one that end up not making that amazing, you know, again, just mentioned Wonder Woman 1 and Birds of Prey 1 and Captain Marvel, you know, these are... These are origin stories, and they're amazing. It's not that women can't do it. The, you know, most of the bad ones are made by men. But yeah, uh, it really does struggle with that. And it also just, it, there's way too little, like, cool superpower action. Like, honestly, trim this sucker down to 40 minutes... It's not the worst pilot episode that I've ever seen. But on the big screen, with these kinds of effects, these kinds of action scenes, and this many characters, no, it's just, it's way too much. The, it, it does not come together. We just, we, we end up with all these characters that, because Sony continues to insist on introducing way too many costumed characters in 
each individual movie, you know, and honestly, this one is not as, as bad with, like, Morbius literally has a character that a lot of people didn't even realize was from the comics because they cut something that was supposed to signify, oh, yeah, see, just like in the comics, and, you know, I, maybe the, maybe it tested badly, maybe the, the effects, Mon you know, yeah, money for the effects, you know, they, they decided to, to save some money there to put elsewhere or something. I'm not 100% sure, but, like, literally, you know, after watching it, you know, I, I went online and found out, oh, that is, okay, he's, that's a guy from the comics, okay. And, you know, I watched it with, with someone else, a friend of mine, and he also didn't pick up on it from the movie because it's not, in the movie as such. It, the character appears, but the thing that makes the character cool doesn't really appear in the movie, and and I wouldn't quite say that that's true of, of this one. I, you know, there's just some of them where it's like, oh, you know, in the future, there'll, there's gonna be something really amazing with it, but they are, you know, but, but yeah, these are characters who don't naturally you know, it's it's more it's closer to Suicide Squad than than Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, technically, yes, there is something that unites them, but not in a way that we get really fun character dynamics and relationships and such. More just here's some characters from the comics. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this one has this thing going on. Okay, let's let's do a brief scene. Where they do the thing, and and people will ch you know, hopefully cheer in their seats and be like, ah, oh, it's, it's a thing, you know, and and that just you know, for me and for a number of others, I've read other you know reviews that that say you know no one in my theater really got super into it, you know, yeah, it's just, yeah, um, that's another you know Nando V movies also pointed out. They're really, you know, I, I don't know if I want to give away exactly. I'll just say, you know, I agree with what he said, and what he said can be summed up as you should probably get rid of at least some of these characters. He specifies which. I, I don't think I want to do that in my video, but yeah, it, it, before the spoiler section at least. Yeah, there's just, there's not really that good of a reason. Because that's the thing, like, the movie plays out somewhat like Terminator, with a bad guy hunting, you know, and then, you, yeah, Cassie, Cassandra Webb, the, the protagonist, Dakota Johnson's character, you know, she's the Kyle Reese, she's the one who knows, you know, somehow has some knowledge about what's going on. But there's not one Sarah Connor, there's three. And there's not really any good reasons. But, you know, imagine if the Terminator was not only, you know, in, in addition to, to Sarah Connor, you also had, like, you know, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. Uh, her, the, uh, I can't offhand remember the, the, yeah, imagine if in addition to, to Sarah, you know, Kyle was trying to protect Ginger and uh, and and Nancy, you know, it, it would have been like, wh why, you know, no, just get it, get it down to to just the ones you, because that's you know, perhaps not as much anymore. But James Cameron movies used to be very lean. He used to cut away anything that isn't strictly necessary, and you know, today they're ballooning out of, the, you know, Avatar Two was pretty ridiculous. Fun film, but pretty ridiculous when it comes to that. But, yeah, you know, if, and the reason, of course, is the three, you know, let's see, Julia Cornwall, Anya Corathon, and Maddie Franklin are important in the comics, and they want these characters, you know, yeah, you know, they're, they're hoping for, and I'm not entirely sure that's going to happen. I don't, I don't think so. They want sequels where these three, you know, yeah, can can be doing this, you know, the, the action hero thing. 
but it's not necessary for them all to be in this one, you know, and that's one of those things, you know, when, you know, sc screenwriting 101, kill your darlings. If there is something that is not strictly necessary to be in the movie, you gotta get rid of it. You know, the, the, the movie just ends up overstuffed. Like, we're, we're trying to, the, the movie's trying desperately to establish, you know, these, these four young women, you know, the, the, yeah, the, the, it, it clearly does, there, someone working on this wanted us to care about these young women, and it just ended up not quite coming to, you know, and it's also, it's one of those things where, like, so yeah, I've, I've talked about, you know, I do think there's too many characters in this movie, but honestly, the number doesn't even have to be a, a complete, like, before watching Eternals, you know, I was like, am I really gonna, you know, they really have this many, what was it, like, seven or ten, or, you know, massive number of, of major characters, and I was seriously wondering how this is probably gonna be, like, overstuffed, and I appreciate the argument could definitely be made that it is, and I do think that a couple of them could have been removed without, you know, just falling apart or something, you know, but... By the end, you know, when I came out of the theater, yeah, I felt like I could probably write a couple hundred words about every single Eternal that we meet in the movie. With this, I don't even, like, they're kind of starting to run together. Like, there were points where, where Jul like, Julia is clearly supposed to be this kind of shy, nerdy type, but they also have, like, nerd traits and kind of you know, being a little bit the, the older sister trying to be responsible kind of thing with Anya, you know, Maddie's definitely the one who's the least responsible of the three, but then there's other times where it's one of the other two who's doing the kind of irresponsible thing. It, yeah, it just... the the I, I'm not sure if the different writers all agreed on how to handle the the yeah the the trinity of Julia Anya and Maddie because there's yeah there's just a couple of things you know and and yeah at the end of the day like i i didn't like hate some of that apparently some people absolutely hated Maddie and she definitely you know it's it's that thing of the character is annoying she's meant to be I, I, yeah, uh, you know, I, I read one review where it was like, wow, I, did you go to school with this character? Did, did you ask her out on a date? And she said no, because that was just, wow, vitriolic. But, yeah, um, you know, the, the, she was probably also the one who felt most at home in the character, um, Dakota Johnson, you know, when she's just, like, being kind of snarky and, and harsh with other people, I thought that worked. Uh, you know, I haven't seen her in very much, but I did think she was absolutely amazing in Bad Times at the El Royale. Uh, you know, and, yeah, there she also has some of that going on, and apparently in some other stuff, she also does the snarkastic thing, and... Yeah, when when that is what is you know, and and these are all very talented people. I, I suppose I I don't you know what I was about to say that I I don't know if Mike Epps is that talented, but to be fair to him, I've actually only seen him directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, and Paul W.S. Anderson can get terrible performances out of very talented people, so I don't know if he is good or not. Um, yeah, it's, it's the first time I see, you know, I've, I've heard amazing things about Sidney Sweeney on Euphoria, you know, so I, 
And and I think she does. I, I really hope she gets more chances after this. Let's see. Right, yeah, she is already in. Let's see. Yeah, she has three movies after this. Two are in post production, one is completed. So they're not going to, like, just get rid of her based on this movie. Oh, that's right. I completely forget. Yeah. She was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, and the character's name is Snake. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that is probably... She's probably playing one of the Manson girls. And all of those did really, really well, so... The Warden Heroes. All right then, but that was a long time ago. I I don't remember at all how. Anyway, um, yeah, I I would like to see her in in more stuff. I think she can prove. Uh, yeah, um, Isabella Mer Merced. You know she, yeah, also makes. Music, she's like, yeah, she was on Nickelodeon, kind of, yeah. So, it's it's one of those things where a lot of people don't want to give, you know, actors and, and performers in general who who started on kids stuff, don't want they don't want to give them too much of a of a chance. You know, I I think she can do significantly better. Then she did here, and Celeste O'Connor replaced Maddie. Let's see, she's also in the new Ghostbusters movie. Oh, and she was in the in the last one. Yeah, I haven't watched any of the new uh, Ghostbusters. I I wouldn't mind it. Just the the eighties ones don't mean that much to me. Uh, I'd like to think that I would be able to find something to love about the 2016 one um, since you know Renegade Cut found several things he really held in high regard about it. And let's see. Oh she's in Freaky. I would very much like to watch that. I do find that concept really really fun. Um, but yeah, most of this, yeah, she, she hasn't been in a lot. Um, eight released things, including Madam Web. Um, let's see, but, but yeah, 100%, like, um, I hope she's not as annoying as her character in this is in real life, but she absolutely, you know, I, I saw the way she behaved and I felt like, okay, this is, this is real, you know. With the others, it just didn't completely feel, yeah. Um, Tahar Rahim, who plays Ezekiel Sim Sims, was apparently dubbed. Um, I appreciate that there's some incredibly talented people who, you know, yeah, performers, actors who don't completely, you know, they, they struggle somewhat with getting, you know, if I understand correctly, basically it was his pronunciation that, you know, yeah, his physical performance seemed quite good, m much better, certainly. It's one of those things, it's like with, with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know, just don't give them too, you know, with Van Damme, don't give him too many lines and give him a character that he can, you know, make, make work. Like someone who's very innocent, very cocky, or surprisingly, a serial killer, he can really nail that. But if you give him these long, you know, really verbose lines, he's just going to struggle through it. And I think maybe that's what, you know, again... Not having heard the original, having only seen this dubbed, his voice dubbed, nobody else dubbed, as far as I could tell, 
I, I don't know if that was also the case. It, it also, it reminded me somewhat of, you know, they, they had a similar thing in The Wolverine, you know, back in 2011. You know, one of the female, major female characters was, was dubbed, and it's just, Hollywood has got to get better at discovering this before you film a lot of the movie, because it just, it, it ends up really awkward. And, um, yeah, Emma Roberts, you know, I, now that I've watched Scream Queens, I kind of can't get enough of Emma Roberts, and I would definitely say that, you know, if there's one actor in this entire movie where I felt like, okay, nailed it. She was the right, you know, this was, this actor was the right choice for this character. This actor really makes the, the character work with the, the acting performance. You know, I, I 100% understand what the vision was here. I, I see it and I'm like, yes, that is exactly, you know, they, they, if, if only, if, you know, if only the rest of the movie could have, could have lived up to that. But yeah. I don't know if I want to give too much away. I'll just say it really plays to her strengths. And, like, there's some non-verbal acting by her that is just fantastic. She doesn't have a huge amount of screen time, but what she has, she just nails it. And 100%. I, I don't know if it's Scream Queens. It could be something else. You know, she was quite good in Scream 4 as well. But whoever cast her appreciates her her knack for conveying a lot without words and yeah honestly like one scene that that had her in a in an important you know scenario might have been my favorite scene like that was just yeah um i think that's Right, um, Adam Scott is in this. I'm not sure I've really seen. I I know I know he's quite beloved, and certainly you know clips I've seen from. Let's see, I think the thing that people are always talking about with him, um, it's got to be somewhere on the Parks and Rec, uh, Parks and Recreation. You know, I've seen some clips from that where he is hilarious. He's in Piranha 3D? Wow. Oh, right. No, yeah, I think I vaguely, vaguely recall him being in that. Glory Days. That I don't actually remember. And Star Trek First Contact. Huh. Hellraiser Bloodline. Wow. Okay, but, but yeah, um... I thought he was fine in this. Um, it's one of those things, like, there's several lines where he's clearly meant to be funny, and I really don't think it's his fault that he isn't. You know, mo most of the cast are, don't don't get to be incredibly funny here. I, I suppose, yeah. Um, Dakota Johnson and Emma Roberts both get to to be funny and certainly there are attempts at comedy for Sydney, Isabella and Celeste. Now, um right, I do think the the fact that they changed stuff I don't think is by itself a problem. I think it's important to to update stories, you know, a lot of the a lot of really incredible stories you know, if you go back and, and revisit them decades down the line, you see, oh, wow, some of this stuff really didn't age well. That doesn't mean that we have to, like, burn all copies. It just means we have to, you know, have conversations about, you know, why did, why was this made the way it was? I don't know if I necessarily thought that they did a lot of, like, updating to... Yeah, um, certainly there were some, 
you know, I can imagine that some of the elements I mentioned earlier about that, you know, how this is shaped by women, some of that stuff I can imagine might not be in the comics. Many of which were, a number of which were made by by men and and sometimes with the with the idea with the viewpoint that most of the readers would also be men which is not always accurate so the the special effects it's just they're not super convincing there's a couple of times where they actually kind of you know go through something that's clearly special effects heavy very very quickly um I, it's possible that it was always made that way, but it kind of felt to me like originally this was a bit longer and like someone at Sony was like, ah, I, you know, too much, too much footage for special effects, you know, trim it down and then send it. And yeah, I mean, I guess I can appreciate that if it's, if it's not that great, Maybe don't, you know, maybe we don't need to see it for, for all that long, but it is just annoying. And I, I appreciate they could not have done this with practical effects because Spider-Man, you know, you gotta, you got people, like, it's not impossible to have stuff with people, like, walking on walls and ceilings and that sort of thing, but the way this was filmed didn't really work for for that now this was shot on location in Massachusetts and New York City and I do think they made good use of some of these locations it really added you know authenticity right some of the costume work is quite good some of the superhero costumes are very very cool um, I think that might be about, yeah, so, um, this movie is an hour and 45 minutes long. I would say it felt maybe 40 minutes longer than that, 30 or 40 minutes or, or so. Not the entire movie, you know, not, not everything in the movie feels slow, but I would definitely say the start. Like, this is one of those movies, you know, if you're not super hyped about the first 40 minutes or so, it's going to feel like a real slog, and you might give up before finishing the movie, and I can't really fault you for that. I can't really sit here and say you're, you'd be missing out, because that's not really, yeah... Um, the movie does not, uh, according to, to Google, and I, I do not believe I have been misled on there for, for this, there is no mid-credits or post-credits scene in this. And, let's see, yeah, I suppose the best elements, you know, I, I did appreciate this thing of, you know, basic, like, essentially what you have here is this movie about four young women who can only really rely on each other in order to keep each other safe from a dangerous man, which, you know, very feminist story, quite appreciate that, and there was definitely some stuff where you see these women who are, you know, very different from each other. And, you know, at the start, they can't really stand each other. None of them can stand each other. You know, and, and yeah, gradually you do start to see, oh, you know, maybe in, you know, given enough time, maybe they could, you know, like each other and, and work well together kind of thing. I won't give away if that happens here, if it's just implied to be happening down the line, but yeah, you know, certainly, you know, some, some effort was made, and 
yeah, there's definitely stuff that's if where it feels like okay, this was you know written and directed by women who have empathy for other women rather than you know misogynistic men. I'm not saying those are the only two options. Um, but but frequently, you know, there there are certain stories where just it needs to be a woman directing, you know. So again, you know, stuff like let's see, yeah, Wonder Woman one, Captain Marvel one, Birds of Prey, and let's see, yeah, I definitely do think the Marvels was helped by it being directed by a woman and also the 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 Babadook and the Nightingale also very much helped by being directed by women. Um let's see. I think that might be about yeah, uh, right. So I made a I made a list. What was I most worried about? The thing I was most worried about for this was they would have the same weaknesses as the previous entries in the Spider-Man-less Sony Spider-Man movies. They feel like they should have come out about 20 years earlier than they did. Bad CGI. They do not have a plan to bring all these together, which is not a great sign for a cinematic universe. Which this never had to be. Like, it would be fine if they just made a bunch of complete standalone movies set in the Spider Man universe. And yeah, sadly, the movie lived down to each of those. And that might be about. Yes, so on Rotten Tomatoes, this has 14%. Based on 158 reviews, 136 of them are rotten. The average rating is 3.40 out of 10. The audience score is 54%, which, yeah, fair. That's, people liked it a lot. You know, regular audience members liked it a lot better than critics. There are more than 250 verified ratings, and the average rating is 3.2 out of five so yeah that is significantly higher now on Metacritic there we go yes on Metacritic it has a 27 out of 100 generally unfavorable as based on 50 critic reviews 33 of them are negative there's 13 mixed and four positive, yeah. And the the users gave it a 2.1 out of 10, generally unfavorable, based on 109 user ratings. 82 of them are negative, 15 positive, 12 mixed. And there are 23 user reviews. And just skimming, because I haven't looked super recent. And the last I looked was yesterday. Yeah, most of them are negative. There's one positive and a few mixed. And on IMDB, it has a 3.8 out of 10, which is actually lower than even Morbius. Based on 7... Uh, let's see, 7.1 thousand ratings and 40.2 percent gave it a 1 out of 10 and you know there's a lot of movies where I say okay that's just ridiculous I don't really blame I mean I feel like a, a 1 a, the, the low the lowest rating giving it the the most negative rating could be interpreted as the the voter saying there was nothing about this at all. Not a single thing that I thought was at all impressive. Like, everything was as bad as it could be. And yeah, with this movie, I can't really... I, I don't quite... I don't completely agree. But certainly it is... You know, that's another... I, I You know, several different 
people said of this, you know, is like, did the people making it feel like, okay, this is going to be, you know, this is, yeah, did they have a, a clear vision of, of what they want, you know, because, like, I, I really don't like Wonder Woman 1984, it had a vision. I, I don't think that vision was, you know, again, the feminist aspects of it, I quite liked. I, I, you know, I think some of them could have been handled slightly better, but I did appreciate this commenting on how, you know, yeah, you know, the, the way that men treat women you know, often abusively, you know, yeah, can, can, yeah, it, it does a, a good job of showing how a number of women suffer under patriarchy. But then it doesn't quite, you know, it, yeah, ultimately it could have, could have handled it better. And yes, I appreciate the irony in me, a man, saying that a woman did, you know, could have handled fem, a feminist element better here. But again, that movie definitely had vision, you know, from, from the very start to the very end. Okay, it's it's going for something fairly specific. This movie, Madam Web, like I don't I don't know. I, I, I kind of just feels like a bunch of bunch of suits in a in a room, you know, jotted down a bunch of different things that they really really wanted because they figured it would make money, and then that list was handed to to some people who, you know, again. 100% S.J. Clarkson, very talented director, you know, and I, I can imagine a talented writer since she wrote a bunch of TV episodes. I, you know, not sure you get to, to keep writing a lot of, of TV if, you know, if what you're delivering is just completely un unbearable, if, you know. But yeah, like it was, it was kind of impossible to make this work. It is, it is very much trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole, whilst also trying to make that square peg appealing to as many demographics as possible, and trying to fit in like tropes that don't completely make sense for, you know, yeah. Um, anyway. Back to the, so yeah, IMDb, 9.8% gave it 2, 8.5% gave it 10, 8.0% gave it 6, 7.8% gave it 5, 74 gave it 4, 70 gave it 3, 5.9% gave it 7, 3.7% gave it 8, 1.7% gave it 9. So, you know, there definitely were some people who did really love the movie and there are currently 165 IMDb user reviews or 131 if you hide spoilers and I'm just gonna real quick so yeah of the 165 49 gave it 1 out of 10 19 gave it 2 16 gave it 3 11 gave it 4 13 gave it 5 15 gave it 6, 18 gave it 7, 15 gave it 8, 8 gave it 9, and 16 gave it 10. So there are also some people, yeah, some people absolutely loved it, but the majority really, really hated it. And let's see that. Um... Yeah, so I think yeah. Um, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna update the ranking, and yeah. Um, ultimately, yes. So, um, it's better than Morbius and Venom 1, and below Spider-Man 3, Venom 2, and onwards. Yeah, that is, yeah. 
because for sure, like Morbius, I don't think there's much at all. Like there's there's little things that, like certainly Matt Smith was entertaining to watch, and I don't know that the idea of like vampire versus vampire was necessarily like the worst. Yeah, um, I think that's all I got for, for the, the positives of that. Um, the first Venom, just like, yeah, it's it's also quite a, a mess. You know, there's a little bit of stuff in there that, that works. Like, for sure, Tom Hardy, entertaining, you know. But if that's all it has, if, yeah. So, so I do think this is better than those, and, but, but yeah, you know, when Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 tops your movie in, in almost every way, yeah, you know, the, I mean, honestly, in some ways, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 is, does a better job of, of being like a feminist piece because it, it really does care about Mary Jane's feelings. She's still, you know, the, the character is still really it's it's this thing of, you know, men writing women. They they kind of they they you know every so often they're they're like, oh uh uh the this this woman is is mad at me. I don't understand why. Uh I don't know. Okay, uh so you know, they go out and they write women and like, I don't know, women get mad at men, you know, but there is at least still some where, yeah, here in, in Madam Web, it ultimately just doesn't, yeah, the feminist elements don't work quite as, yeah. Um, and that is it for the review itself. So, from here on out, there will be spoilers for everything in this movie. So, starting with notes taken while watching. So, yeah, I like the, yeah, opening with the, the logo. There's a little bit of, like, psychic flash thing going on through some of the, the logos. And it's kind of cool, the thing of, you know, 100 years of Columbia... Yeah, and let's see. Yeah, uh, the opening scene, you know, in in the Amazon in in seventy three. You know, the just there's too much. It's it's very awkward the way you have all this exposition because they have a lot of information to get across. You know, okay, so. This, you know, we, we realized pretty quickly, this woman is, you know, the, the mother of Cassandra. You know, this is, this is Constance. So, you know, okay, she's, she's pregnant, and we have this thing, you know, why is the, you know, why is she there? She explains about, you know, curing, yeah, curing all these diseases with the... The, the spider DNA, we get the thing about the spider people, which I feel like the spider people, again, I, re I, I hate saying, you know, this thing that's, that's like, there in the comics and, and maybe, like, important in the comics, you know, get rid of it or something, but they just... I I really don't think honestly for a while I didn't think that she would get in touch with them because she does get some instruction in that you know as soon as her powers start to manifest when she's in the car you know when she um yeah you know she she sees a bunch of things that later come you know later actually happen I thought that was all that we were gonna get and it does also feel like the Peru scene late in the movie is is trimmed down you know because it is like she just she leaves and like a, you know not very many minutes after she comes back 
you know, it's not it's not a, a stroll down the street. You know, the the let's see, they're so they're they're in New York for for a lot of the movies. So let's see, New York to Peru. Uh, let's see, it's an eight-hour flight. Yeah, that's. I'm not saying they sh they need to show that. Certainly doesn't need to be, you know, in real time or anything. But it just feels like just the yeah. Um, it it's the kind of thing I I can imagine. There's probably at least one comic book out there where the spider people. I think they call them las arañas. They're only very briefly there, and that kind of thing can work for a comic book movie, a comic book. But once you have a movie, it just it feels like that they're barely there, you know. Um, let's see. Right. Um, I I did also appreciate, you know, clearly someone working on this had a, a neat little idea of this thing of. You know, frequently we're or on multiple occasions we're seeing Cassandra through something that looks like a spider web. Sometimes it literally is. Often it's like broken glass kind of thing. But but yeah, you know, just way too much exposition here at the the very start. And it's also this thing of so yeah, there you know she's looking for the the spider and Sim shows up and he's like. So, lady, spider, you know, where is it? And she's like, it could take a long time to find, you know, and he, he walks away, and like, maybe two minutes after, okay, maybe three, she's like, I found it! And it's like, because you didn't, you didn't need to have, you could literally have just had him, like, you know, just, just have, Let's see. Because basically, what you need, what you need to accomplish here is for him to go in and, like, take pictures. You know, so he needs to know that she's gone from, from the tent. Just have him go into the tent and, and like, maybe, you know, later in the movie, Cassandra talks to, you know, thinks out loud. Have him do that here, you know. Sims could go, like, I keep telling her we gotta find this spider. She keeps, you know... Oh, it's so difficult to find. You know, I, I can't even deal with her right now. I haven't talked to her for several hours now. I gotta look at the research. You know, maybe there was some other reason why the he couldn't look at the research. Some someone was messing around with the tent or something. You know, and then we hear she she comes in, but no, she apparently just stumbled upon it in the couple of minutes between these two scenes. And it's this thing of you know, because the screenwriter is like. We gotta have our big introductory scene where, you know, and a, a character that's important to the protagonist, if not the protagonist herself, describes something that's important to them and important to... And I get it, you know, the finding the spider was a big deal. You know, it didn't end up being that spider, but, yeah, the fact that the, the, that she, you know, the, the, that Cassandra from being a baby is, is affected by a spider, that is important. Um, let's see, right, and I, f I forget if I noted it, so I'll just say it here, I, this is one of those annoying things where the audience will see a scene, and then later, a major character, maybe the protagonist, will be explained the contents of that scene, and it's like, you really didn't need to have that there twice, because now the audience are just like, okay, we get it, we already know this, you know. This does that, Thor 2 does that, Man of Steel does that twice in, in one year. You know, because, yeah, you think about it. If this movie just opened in 2003 with Cassandra driving the ambulance, and then we didn't see what happened in 1973 until she learns it very late in the movie, because instead we're just sitting there waiting for her to finally, you know, realize, okay, yeah, so, you know, something, there's some kind of psychic ability, you know, it, it's, I'm not the first person to point out, it takes too long, it takes up too much of the movie for her to, to realize 
that that's you know, and it, it kind of feels like padding. It, I think if if this had been like a forty-two minute pilot, you know, they could have very quickly gotten into. Yeah. Also, she realizes that she could save the you know she manages to save the pigeon. That means that she could have saved O'Neill. Were I mean, was that supposed to be like? Oh, I guess. Okay, so I guess the idea is we see that it's possible for her to fail to save someone with O'Neill, but it's also possible to save someone through the pigeon. Am I a horrible person if I th would maybe have preferred it to be the other way? I don't like dead pigeons. It's, you know, and I, I, like I mentioned, I didn't think Mike Epps was that great in, in those two Paul Davis Anderson movies. But, I don't know, it just felt like, because if you're going to do something like that, that's again where an R rating would probably have been good. There are a number of movies where there's a, a graphic death fairly early in the movie, and for the rest of the movie, you know, yeah, again, mention Terminator, you know, that one opens with these very graphic deaths that tell the audience this is what the Terminator can do. You know, if he gets close enough, he can definitely, you know, murder. You know, so so the... And, and yeah, you know, in, in part because it's PG-13 and just... Yeah, you know, also, did, did, you know, just we didn't care enough about the care. And, and that's, yeah, it's it's one of those things you just, I think this movie kills off too many major characters, or major, too many characters that are meant to be important to major characters way too early in the movie. I do, I, I thought that the, the death of the NSA uh, agent, um... Uh, is the uh, Jill Jill Hennessy? You know what? I'm I'm or is it? Never mind. I'm not entirely sure who the but but yeah the NSA agent. You know because her death tells us some important things about the yeah about Sims. So. That I thought really worked. I, I think that should probably have been the only death we of, of a person we saw early on. Because, like, the music, that's another thing. that This movie really does not earn its big dramatic moments. You know, there's, yeah, several where the music is like, isn't this so sad? Isn't this, like, overpowering with emotion? And it's just n not really, because we don't know this character well enough. We don't care quite enough about this character. And, yeah, just, um, but the, let's see, yeah, um, so, back to the, back to the beginning, yeah, um, Sims shoots a couple of people after she, you know, she's, she's showing the spider, which, wow, I didn't realize he, was that serious about calling dibs on being, you know, being able to see it? But okay, and yeah, you know the the. Um, I really wish that they delved deeper into because he says, "When my family was starving, nobody helped us," and that actually, like, I think that is a fine villain motivation. But if you're not going to do, like, yeah, I mean, I get, because the, so basically the villain's motivated by the, the you know, feeling slighted and be, being greedy, you know, because we learned later, like, he's, you know, it wasn't, yeah, basically he wants to have control of his situation. He is, he feels anxious at the notion that he'll ever again be in a uh, yeah be be stuck in a situation that he can't get out of you know where where his loved ones suffer but for most of the the film yeah it just doesn't really like he has resources 
though he, we only do ever see the one person he has. One, and, and that's, again, like, if he has all this money, why doesn't he just hire someone? Why does it need to be him personally? Because uh, as far as I could tell, there wasn't anything specific, like... <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I couldn't really tell, because it, it's not that he, like, he doesn't mind if innocents die, so that's not, because that would be one reason you'd maybe be, you'd maybe say, no, I'm not going to hire someone and, and tell them, go and, and, you know, take this person out, because what if they hit someone innocent? He's, you know, like, he's, he's clearly not worried about if someone he kills is innocent or a cop but just yeah uh, you know it does why does if he has this if he has this enormous amount of money why doesn't he just hire someone like he could he doesn't even have to you know he can tie up loose ends later he he's got you know the magic touch he can it just touch them and and poison them he could you know he could be like you know job well you know you you did it job well done Here's here's the money hands the bills. I want to shake your hand to you know. There you go. Take take them out. So it's not that. Yeah, it's just and and the thing. I I really think the the so so the character I guess is um Amaria, played by Socia Mamet as as best as I can tell from looking at the the um face yeah faces on the the yeah i i really think she raises more questions than she answers um i think it should have been an ai you know and and maybe there could be something about you know yeah so some some reason why if he's got the money to to you know he says he specifically again it's not cuz it would be fine if it was like just just have it be his sister or something, and it's like you know when we were growing up, we th th you and I were the only people who who uh, who could take care of each other. You know we're gonna stop. You know I know you're not gonna let me, you know, be taken out by these three, you know, spider women. But no, he specifically says I pay you a lot of money. Well, if you have that kind of money, why aren't you hiring people? Because he keeps failing. In ways that, like, he wouldn't be fail. He wouldn't be failing if there was more than one person attacking, because there's only one person defending. You know, it just, yeah. Um, I really think it could have worked if, you know, yeah, maybe near the end, maybe have someone point out to him, you know, when you were you know when when your family was starving you know you were really upset that that people weren't helping you but look at all the the people you've hurt you know i'm not saying he has to redeem himself but at least confront him with it because at the end of the day like honestly the the confrontation there at the end i mean would it have really been super different emotionally if the reason he was you know, trying to to take out the the spider women was that he wanted to be the only person who wore spider, you know, super suit or something. Like, it didn't really feel, you know, yeah. He he doesn't have anything. He he feels confident that one day these women will kill him, but that there's no other. Like, he doesn't know them. You know that that's another thing. You know, once the there's the realization, you know, I didn't know we were hunting teenagers. That could be a perfectly fine time to have, you know, to explain why he's not going out there with a bunch of other people to to try to take them out. You know, he could be like, okay, so these are the three, you know, we're we're targeting now. Let's go. And you know, the leader is like, you didn't tell us we were gonna be gunning for teenagers. No, here. Have your money back. Never call me again. You know, and and then Sims could be like, I don't have time to hire new people. Okay, I'm just gonna go it alone. You know, there. It's it's that was off the top of my head. You know, it's so easy to to make this work, but 
They didn't have a coherent idea. They just had a bunch of studio notes. And one of those studio notes was probably, you know, Sims alone hunts the, you know, them. And, yeah. Um, so, back to the, the start of the movie. Yeah. Um, Sims shoots the the this this you know very very pregnant woman who literally like just talked about how you know oh the the baby's you know kicking up a storm the you know just i i don't think i have a huge problem with the idea of just saying unless the entire movie is about it don't have a pregnant person attacked in any kind of physical way that could at all like harm the the baby and the movie really isn't about it like the, that's the thing you could so easily have had like as soon as you know she she you know yeah he manages to get the spider runs away she can't quite chase him because of her physical condition and and you know the the um, yeah the spider people show up and you know they're like you know you're you're going to go into labor oh but there's no you know there's no one around we'll you know we'll we'll take you back to to our place we'll make sure the the baby is is safe and and you know you don't even have to have her die in the the process you know, you could have, like, even if you really badly want some kind of thing of, you know, oh, she grew up never knowing her mother, have the mother be forced to stay with the, the spider people. You know, maybe there's some kind of thing of, like, if you're an adult and you deal with the spider people, you can't go back to the, the regular world, something like that. You know, it's only babies that can, you know, maybe... Maybe she even meets her mother when she goes to talk to the the spider people. You know, you could you could definitely do a thing like that. But this thing of of having the like it's just it's in such bad taste, you know. And again, I'm not saying it's that you can never do something like this. You know, I I love the Nightingale, and that one, you know, has something even more grueling and disturbing to watch. But the movie's about it. The movie is actually about what it does. To, you know, and, and The Babadook is also a movie where you're worried about, you know, in, in there it's not like, you know, she's she's not currently pregnant and the, the baby is, I want to say, they say his, I want I believe he's seven in, in that movie, you know. But it's still, you know, not that old of a kid. He needs protecting there's a lot of threats to his safety, but the movie's about it, so it doesn't become just shock value, you know. And yeah, it just it really felt like that was what it was here. You know, I, I really hope that not too many you know, pregnant people or you know or or their their spouses, you know, watch this not knowing that. Honestly, I, I think I think an argument could be made for a boycott based on that, based on how just gross it is to to try to yeah. And let's see, yeah, uh, when the spider people you know traverse the the trees, that really felt like okay. This probably took at least a few seconds more originally, but they wanted to save money on the the special effects, so they they trimmed down. How much there was and yeah we go from the baby being born directly to 2003 where she's 30 years old and honestly the 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 driving the the ambulance driving wasn't completely terrible that was maybe some of the more tense like I already mentioned I don't I didn't think the action itself worked you know extremely well so but yeah um the yeah um 
I just realized I forgot to mention my rating. I don't know if I want to put it here. I think I'm just going to put it in the in the description box if I don't forget. You know what? I'm going to put it there right now so that I do not in fact forget and there we go. Um, yeah. So, uh, let's see. But, but yeah, you know, the, the ambulance driving, there was some decent, you know, stuff there. Um, yeah, and the, the drive both starts and ends with a smash cut, which I thought was a, a decent enough idea. And it's pretty, they actually felt the need to outright, like, the moment that they, they, Adam Scott's character is referred to by others as Ben. That should be enough, you know, but no, after the, the ambulance driving, you know, there's the, the, you know, the, the family's like, oh, you saved, you know, the, the, um, yeah, you, you saved this, this woman, you know, and, and Cassandra is like, oh, that was all. Ben Parker, right here, famous Spider-Man character Ben Parker, you know, he's the, just like, come on, man, it, that was not, look, if you just refer to him as Ben, once we learn that his, you know, ah, uh, hold on, is it sister or sister-in-law, whatever, you know, yeah, um, the, the you know, yeah, his, his relative Mary is pregnant in the year 2003. We, you know, yeah, if, if you read enough Spider-Man comics, you, you know where this is going, you know. And the, and the fact that it's 2003 is, of course, suggesting that this is the Tom Holland Spider-Man. You know, he'd be around... Yeah, it, it fits with his age in, in you know... The, the, um, ah, can't believe I'm blanking on the, the, uh, homecoming, you know. And, yeah, and, and, um, as they're eating the, the food, the, the takeout, <laughs> Breakfast at Tiffany's plays. I feel like I should deduce several points just for reminding me that song exists. I'm just kidding. That's fine. And the... Yeah, they make a joke about, you know, oh, you know, you will, and, and she, you know, oh, see, it doesn't say anything. Oh, their printer is broken. We shouldn't eat their food. Yeah. You know, it's, it's lines where you can tell, like, like, they might as well be holding up an applause sign or, or like, you know, blinking the, the, you know, laugh, yeah, or, or add a laugh track or something, like, clearly we're supposed to laugh, but it just doesn't quite work, and, yeah, uh, we learned that the, you know, Cass's neighbor, um, Anya, is struggling to, to make rent, and, you know, we learned later her father was undocumented and he got deported. I really wish that they had spent more time on that. That's a extremely important, really relevant issue right now. Yeah, you know, let's, let's actually dig into that. But, yeah, it's just they don't really do anything with... See, See honestly... Cassandra, Julia, Anya, and Maddie, like, 
give each of them their own movie where th this, you know, but instead we, you know, because the movie's juggling these four young women, we don't, who are, you know, essentially treated as if they are roughly equally important by the film, you know, like, Cass is the protagonist, but the other three do have a lot of screen time. Yeah, we end up not delving into any of, you know, because all four have trauma, and we don't, like, essentially the other three, their, their trauma is just there to, like, motivate them. Cass, there's a little bit of exploration of it, but, like, just the, the... Yeah, it it doesn't. I've I I'm not sure I 100% felt that you know there there's the thing about you know she she says why did my mother take me there? I feel like didn't she only say that out loud like right before we're told no no that was because that was the only way to save you, you know kind of thing which like if the movie had set that up right at the start. You know, because it's so it's so straightforward. You know, the, the you have the scene of them eating takeout, and you know, oh, there's no the the uh, what's it called the, the the fortune cookie. There's no fortune, or the, or the fortune is unclear. You know, he says you you never make plans. Just right there, insert line. Maybe it originally was there, and it tested poorly or something, because it feels like a perfect place for it. I, I can't possibly be the only person who thinks that this is right where that kind of thing would go. He says, you never make plans, and then she says, my mother apparently didn't plan on having me, so how am I supposed to plan on any, you know, if, if my own mother didn't want to have me, obviously nobody else does. You know, that's melodramatic, that's, you know, ends the scene on a downer note. Unless you can find some way to, to bring it back up. But at least it introduces the concept. But I didn't even realize that she, like... I guess she maybe mentions it in the... When, when she's at the, at the baby shower. She does say that it was dangerous for her mother. I think I was just so distracted by the, the cringe comedy element that I didn't even think about... Oh, right. She's... Oh, no. Yeah, okay. She's upset because she feels like her mother must not have cared enough to, to put her in that situation. I, I was just sitting there, you know, watching these, you know, the, the reactions, especially Emma Roberts. Yeah, I guess that is where it's it's supposed to be. And that's, the, I just, I think there's too much else going on in, in that scene. It's also one of the first times we see her, her powers, and she's really struggling with, you know, the the... Yeah, trying to trying to figure out. I think it should have happened before her powers manifest at all. So again, have it in the the Chinese takeout scene. And let's see. Um. Yeah, we have the scene where she ends up in the in you know alone in this. Closed car underwater. That was also very contrived. This thing. okay. So let's see. There's a passenger inside the car, which is upside down. She crawls in and and like un unclenches unclenches the the strap thing, and and you know Adam Scott catches the the other person and, and drags them out. And before Cass can get out of the car, the door slams shut and the car folds over. The it was just like, I get it. They they wanna they gotta get her into this kind of situation. You know, it's her cocoon. It's where her powers come. You know, it just there's there's gotta be ways that are less contrived and less just ridiculous. For, for this sort of thing, it just, yeah, um, and, yeah, 
yeah, and we start seeing her able to replay, you know, maybe 30 seconds or so. And let's see the. Yeah, we see Sims see the the three Spider Women destroy him, and I gotta say, the moment that I heard him, yeah, the there were several seconds there where I was sitting there thinking, is this the first time he sees it? Why is he seeing it now? And I was so relieved when he just comes right out and said, you know. Every night, the same vision, I am tormented by it, uh, you know, and, and that's, that's the motivation for his, his mission to, to you know, to, to stop the, the, the women. I really thought that worked, you know, that, because that's the kind of thing, there you do have to have exposition, you have to explain this, and yeah, 100%. He's been having this vision for 30 years, you know, and that's also, like, I think that should have been the first time we see him be, like, completely ruthless, but he actually already was, so we don't, he's not that different in the, you know, so that, I, I thought, was a little bit of a, a wasted opportunity. He could have been, like, apologetic. He didn't, he didn't have to kill anyone. Like, that was only because it was written that he killed people. But, like, you could just have had him, like, wrestle the spider away from her in, in 73. And then, you know, he only started killing people after he saw the visions, you know. Because that still is, like, greedy. He's still t t taking away the, the cure kind of thing, you know, but, yeah, um, but I definitely did, you know, yeah, you know, once he starts saying this stuff to this woman, you know, then we're like, why is he telling her, you know, like, obviously part of it is the audience needs to know this stuff, but it is like this thing of, would he really tell her, but then he gets to the, you know, he starts saying, you know, I know the NSA has this technology, and you know, yeah, he 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 poisons her and tells her, you know, if you know, yeah, poison touches her, tells her if you you know give me the password, I will. It's you know, yeah, unpoison you. I'll I'll give you the antidote. She gives him the password, but he still kills her. You know that tells us. Yeah, this is who he is. He is willing to kill, you know, yeah, like, hypothetically, he didn't at all have to do that. You know, I, like, there's, um, yeah, there's, there's options, you know, so that tells us how, how ruthless and, and terrible he is, and, and again, you know, a story that is at least in part t told by women and for women, you know, an, an attractive young man, you know, seduces a, a woman, lies to her, you know, manipulates her, uses her career against her, and then murders her. You know, these these are things that sadly a number of misogynist men, you know, actually do. This is these are things that some men today do to women, and and have done. You know, for for yeah, as long as patriarchy has existed. So you know that and and that's actually that's one element I did really feel like worked. The the yeah, the the male villain is, or yeah, the villain is a young man who hurts women, and you know, yeah, the he makes it so they're not safe even when police are around. If you're one of the people who think that the police will keep you safe, and yeah, you know, he's he's going to kill three young women, three teenage girls, for something that he feels confident. 
that they will do in the future. He is he is essentially killing innocent people. You know, it, it still wouldn't be okay, but you could appreciate, okay, you know, let's say that you know, let's let's say he was like Dexter. He's like killing serial killers. But no, he's actually killing so he's killing three young women that he does not have any reason to think have already her, you know, and that's again, you know, you could easily have this be like, oh, you know, they killed my brother. But if you had that, it wouldn't work quite as well because then he'd, you know, again, still not really okay to do, especially if that brother was also a villain. But he has, you know, more. Yeah, you can you can have. It's it's easier to sympathize with, uh, you know, revenge. But no, he's selfishly killing teenagers because he he's worried about losing what he has you know so so yeah that I thought worked and and again you know after this one scene that didn't really like I didn't care that much about the villain outside of this one scene and let's see um what did I write? Oh, right, right, yeah. Uh, so yeah, Cass gets a Pepsi, which, you know, I, I agree with those who say there's definitely too much Pepsi product placement in this. And I guess Pepsi... I, I, was Pepsi always the choice here? Because, like... Because it's a joke by now. Like, everybody said, you know, the, this thing of, you know, I'd like a Coke, is Pepsi okay... You know, that's that's a joke that's been told for for years and years, you know. And and yeah, like literally she's given a Pepsi and immediately asks if she can get something else. And she actually asks for a beer and, and Ben is like, That could be dangerous and she's like, I don't care. I would rather endanger myself than actually have to take even the tiniest little sip of a Pepsi, you know, so that's, yeah. I mean, I don't know if they think that, you know, but then by the end of the movie, the, the P from Pepsi murders Sims, even though, like, I mean, wasn't he already... He got hit by a car twice, or two cars, once each. That didn't phase him, but... The, the, I mean, I guess he was injured because of the fireworks. Like, it's the kind of thing where, like, if the other times he had, like, let's say he had, like, a button that he had to, like, push, and the other times he was like, a car, push button, and, and that, like, yeah, maybe, maybe there's, like, some kind of defensive shield around him or something. And then this last time, you know, and, yeah, she, she picked up on, oh, he has to push the button. So, you know, just, yeah, prevent him from, from pushing the button, you know, Infinity War kind of, you know, don't let the gauntlet close, kind of, you know, don't let the fingers snap thing, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. You know, and that could also be something where, you know, yeah, the three Spider-Women would actually get to do something and in, in that climax, I, I appreciate they do things in, in others, you know, there's the bit where he lands on the, on the roof and they, like, zap the, the, of the, of the ambulance, I mean. And, yeah, we, we meet Emma Roberts, Peter Parker's mother, and, yeah, just the, the cringe comedy as, like, you know, because it's the kind of thing of, like, you could have written something like you don't. It doesn't even have to be true. You're in a baby shower. Don't, don't tell the incredibly pregnant woman about you know the the and and again the, you know about the the yeah dying in in childbirth, and this again felt very much like the kind of thing that would be thought up conceived, if you will, by women. You know, I'm I'm sure that at least one of the the you know, women writing this movie, you know, S.J. Clarkson and, and Claire Parker, I'm sure at least one of them has, at least once in their lives, been stuck at a baby shower. You know, she even says, you know, I don't want to get roped into anything. You know, she ends up roped into it. 
and and like I feel like maybe they you know on some level like in their in their more like we all have our, our weaker moments and in, in a weaker moment where they're like ah oh, I wish I had you know messed with this this you know mother to be's mind and and been like ah oh, you know people die in childbirth you know or some, something like that and and yeah came up with the scene or maybe they were like oh god I, if one you know I, I sure hope at my baby shower no you know there isn't a woman talking about you know dying in, in childbirth kind of thing but just yeah um, Emma Roberts played it perfect like every every step of the way you know you have the thing of because because she go you know she's got like the Emma Roberts has this smile that just lights up the room you know when when she's playing a character who's happy it's like wow you know the world is sunshine and rainbows and you know she's like Come on, you've got to have one happy. You know, she's smiling so much; it looks like her, her, like it. The the integrity of the upper half of of her head is is you know, if she smiles any broader, like the top of her head is just gonna, you know, yeah, come off like a Monty Python cartoon head or something. But just yeah, you know, big broad smile. Come on, you got to have a happy memory of of your mother. You know, and she's like, oh, you know, I uh, no, my my mom died in childbirth, and and like Emma's face just like, oh no, <laughs> and then she just keeps going, and that was actually honestly, if I watch, you know, I like I mentioned, I'd like to see Dakota Johnson in more stuff. I'd like to see her in a straight comedy because this legitimately was quite good. You know, she's like, you know, I'll, I'll just say, okay, don't don't worry. It's not actually gonna. It's not very likely to happen. You know, it. It's extremely rare. You know, she did, and and then she goes into this this backstory of like, okay, you know, so my mother, you know, she was very far away from the hospital, and you know, I don't know what she was thinking of doing, and and again, like every so often, it'll cut back to Emma Roberts' face, and she just looks horrified, and it's just it's perfect. I'm so glad that because because Emma Roberts, she's been acting for for quite some years let's see the the yeah she's in something from 2001 you know 23 years ago and way back then yeah she she had an uncredited role as girl in purple t-shirt in America's sweethearts so yeah you know there was a time where she <laughs> Yeah, she she was a, a child actor, child singer. Apparently, she did. There's a couple of music videos. Yeah, you know the the. Um, I'm really glad that she is still doing this because she's just she's so funny. It's it's, yeah, my my favorite scene. As I mentioned, the as as a yeah, as you could maybe piece together from what I said in the in the review itself about how, yeah. Emma Roberts acting in that. Yeah. Um, let's see. And yeah, she has a deja vu all over again. And uh, let's see. Yeah, and and it looked like she was going to go into the the building with fireworks, but then that's only at the very end. Honestly, there's probably like 40, 30 or forty minutes between the scene setting up the fireworks heavy building, which was a Pepsi. Like, dude, would why would there be a lot of or or wait or was it just that? There's a Pepsi ad on top of the building, even though the building itself has nothing to do with Pepsi. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I it, maybe maybe that is it. I I don't you know I don't live in America. I don't know exactly how that kind of thing would look. I can appreciate that, but yeah, it just it felt like it was too early. Set, setting that up happened too early. There was too long between the setup and the payoff. And let's see. yeah, O'Neill dies, and and yeah, you know the score is like screaming in our ears. Isn't this emotional? 
and like no no one in in the theater seemed to to really be like yeah deeply emotionally devastated by it and it's not like you can't really get it like okay so the following is an extremely different movie but the movie monster you know opens with a, a short summary of the protagonist's life up to the leading up to the events not including the events of the movie itself and at the end of that summary there's a very dramatic very stark visual and I've shown that movie to seven people in total all of them had a, a strong reaction to that you know and that was also a very short space of time that we'd known the character before that point that movie is R-rated I don't think they could have done the same in in this but again I don't think that they should have you know I don't think there was any reason to kill off O'Neill now let's see yeah, and we see that the NSA tech was indeed able to find the three spider women and Cass is watching a Christmas carol on TV. Specifically the part where he is is talking, you know, and it looked like a it looked like it was one of the the better ones at that um does that make me sound like a snob to say that? Oh my god, it actually was. Holy crap. I was about to, to joke that, no, that, wow, that shows how long it's been since I watched that because I didn't actually recognize him. It's the 1951 Alistair Sim. Like, it's a masterpiece. It's one of the best versions. You know, it's, I do think the Patrick Stewart one is, is quite good and certainly the uh i want to say uh george ah hold on it's he's in um i can't believe i'm blanking on that uh name Do dr strange love he's in dr strange love um george c scott his christmas carol is also quite good but for my money 100 percent. if you're going classic like there's some fun interpretations but if you're going for a classic for straight adaptation of the book yeah, 1951's Christmas Carol. Yeah, really, really well done. Um, but yeah, it's it's the part of the movie where he's, you know, he's talking to the 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 ghost of the spirit of things yet to come. Can can you tell that I'm slightly worried about being audited by one of the the jackals of Seth Meyers? you know, viewership, anyway, yeah, you know, he's like, tell me, can I change things? Which is, you know, part of what the movie is about, seeing, being, being shown visions and, and being able to, to change. So it's, it's very, you know, screenwriting one-on-one, babies first allegory kind of thing to literally show something that, that clearly you know, like, that's literally the situation she's in. And, yeah, the, you know, she is, on, on the second attempt, she's able to rescue the, the CG. I want to say it's a pigeon, but certainly a bird of some kind, by opening the window. Um, the train station has a, you know, a, a tracking shot. I'm going to go ahead and assume that, you know, Brian De Palma visited the set, sneezed, and they put it in the movie. And and that's again like you, that would have been a great like if the if the tracking shot went on for longer, and if it was a bit more dynamic and and like vivid, like that could have been. And they did. I don't think they had to do a tracking shot at all. But if you're gonna do one, like Brian De Palma got so much out of a train station 
in an in yeah you know the the there's a reason like the untouchables is from 1987 in i want to say it must have been about the year 2004 that was shown to me by me and me and others by someone who was helping us appreciate you know the craft of cinema better a movie that was 17 years old almost old enough to vote was shown to us rather than a brand new one you know because there is so much there to the the you know the scene in general and some of the the tracking shot just again honestly there's probably a studio person who was like oh hey you know i i recently rewatched untouchables you know can you can you do like a, a tracking shot at a train station because that was really great in that movie you know and yes, I do intend to eventually do a full video specifically on that and other Brian De Palma movies. Yeah, individual videos on each of those. Yeah, on, on multiple Brian De Palma movies. Yeah, you know, but don't invoke it and then don't really do it. Like, because, you know, it's a tracking shot for a while and then it just cuts and it didn't really feel like it's, yeah. And yeah, there's some more visions and and predictions on the on the train. And yeah, because she sees this stuff, she does manage to get the three spider women off the train before Sims attacks them. One of the one of the characters says I, I think I think she said I'm going to call Jonah J. Jo J. Jonah Jameson is that that was a yeah and see. yeah um, so the movie needs to isolate these four women and the thing they come up with is, you know, everyone thinks that Cass tried to, to kidnap them. And I, I do appreciate, you know, because, like, you would like to think that isn't how you would react if you were, if someone was trying to save your life. Or, you know, you would, if you were trying to save someone else's life, you would hope they wouldn't react, like, you know, that, that kind of thing. But because there is so much anxiety, there's so there's so many different sources of danger for women in modern society. Many of the men, yeah, you know, you end up with this like, yeah. Sometimes people, you know, there was this. Um, it it kind of reminds me of. Um, let's see, I I always get her name, Hoots. Um, the uh, yeah. She recently did a video. I'm actually. I'm just gonna link the video because it was really excellent. Um, there we go. Um, but yeah, she did a recent video called "Are We Dating the Same Guy?" Digital Whisper Networks in the hashtag #MeToo era, where she specifically talks about you know women who've been you know yeah who have who have suffered under this kind of thing some end up hyper vigilant and that's kind of what we see in this movie also you know the yeah the 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 moment that they have a chance to talk to a cop they they immediately say we're being kidnapped you know when yeah that yeah it's understandable considering how many danger sources there are and let's see. Yeah. Um, then we have the. Um, yeah. You know, once once they're in the in the woods, uh, you know, they they talk about 
the the yeah you know the the seemingly or yeah Cass has encountered each of them individually before the the train you know and suddenly they they remember that you know and and the yeah you know so they're they're like you know we're we're connected and you know she's like yeah, I saved you. You know how I knew how to do that? How? Because we're connected. And she drives off. But yeah, so, um, so basically, yeah, she gets them into the woods because the cops are looking for her. They They never saw Sims. And let's see... Yeah, and they get they get really hungry, and I do appreciate you know there's that that line about you know you wouldn't like me when I'm hangry, and one of them's like I don't like you now, and yeah they they discuss whether or not to have cherry pie and yeah this again feels like you know yeah written by women this scene of you know these three teenage girls who like. Essentially, all three of them like the idea of these young men, you know, showering them with attention. And basically, it's just some, you know, uh, where uh, Maddie herself is 100% down. The other two are like, I mean, we were told we had to be responsible and careful, you know. That felt very much like, you know... Yeah, adult women reflecting on their, you know, teenage, you know, and, and everyone, I, I would argue every teenager makes at least one bad decision. It's just, you know, not everyone has to face, like, really severe consequences, but if we're being honest, we all made at least one mistake. You know, I was very, very fortunate that, you know, my, my father definitely helped me av avoid you know yeah more more severe consequences than yeah and then they they play that song let's see i think um it might just be i'm, I'm just gonna get the title real quick so and, and, Um, yeah, uh, Meredith Brooks, uh, bitch, you know, I'm a bitch, I'm a lover, that, that whole one. Um, yeah, which, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's accurate that it was like 2003 or, or around that time at least. Um, let's see. Yeah, and... We see that the three girls are table dancing to Toxic by Britney Spears, which, you know, a scene that I had been warned would be in this movie by at least one reviewer before watching. Yeah. Um, I didn't think that that was necessarily the worst. That, that, that might be the best, like, needle drop in the movie because on the surface that is definitely you know yeah it was very popular at the time I can imagine it probably would have gotten a lot of, of you know I don't know if they would have not all of them would have table danced but a lot of young women danced to that, that song at that time and yeah you know she's literally okay so I'm going to I'm going to get the the lyrics real quick. Um so the let's see. Um yeah, so so you have this thing of um yeah, um a guy like you should wear a warning. It's dangerous. There's no escape. 
is, uh, let's see. With the taste of your lips, I'm on a ride. You're toxic. You know, he's, he, he poisons people with his touch. And, let's see. I think that might be. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, there's, that, that was legitimately a, a decent note. And, and, yeah, um, Cass attacks with a, with a car crash. I, that's, that's fun to, to see. I'm not sure I've ever, you know, and that's also where, like, okay, so what you're saying is there's a, there's a building there's a, there, you know, a major character is trying to get into the, the building to, you know, because there's someone in there to attack and, the, you know, someone uses a car to, to ram into, you know, yeah, someone definitely watched Terminator recently and, yeah, um, I will say that got, it was like a, a jolt, that was, that was pretty cool for, for us viewers, I mean. And let's see. Yeah, we once the the uh, let's see, they get to. I guess it's like a hotel, motel kind of thing. And yeah, you know, we learn about the you know Anya's father was deported. Julia's mother is in a psych ward, and you know, so so she moved to be with the the family of of her her father and they don't really want her there and this again this is a thing that happens you know and the movie doesn't explore it this is like i would i would much rather that they had just made one of these characters you know yeah the the and yeah, I, th I think if I recall correctly, um, uh, hold on, um, Nando suggested that it should be Julia, and I could definitely see that. Yeah, Ex actually, yes, because Cass, you know, I mean, all four of them don't have their parents, but Cass lost her mother when she was, you know, as she was being born. Julia had her mother until recently, but, yeah, you know, mental institution, like, the, the, for, for some people who've, whose loved ones are, are in a mental institution, it can basically feel like they've lost them forever, kind of thing, so those two characters have that in common, you know, it's, like, Again, I, I do think it's interesting to explore Anya and Maddie as well, but because all of, you know, yeah, all four of them are in the same movie instead of just two of them, that means that we can't really, because, like, the, the father being deported is not quite as, as you know, yeah, it's just it's a it's a different circumstance. And really, Maddie, you know, she technically does have both of her parents. It's just that they don't really they they can't. What what I think what she said was they resent, the, you know, the 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 changes to their lives that having a kid created. You know, and again, that is an interesting yeah. And I do appreciate this thing of of pointing out you know rich kids are not necessarily happy and yeah there are a lot of rich adults who clearly resent their kids really you know yeah so that is something important to explore and the movie really doesn't it's just brought up and and dropped there like for it essentially wouldn't have changed the movie if like the th the the three young women were sisters you know and they all lost their parents all at once you know in the same event or something you know because it's just it's just mentioned you know 
And yeah, Cass tries to abandon them, but ends up not right. And I will say, when Sims said, you know, there, there's this line, which again also didn't feel completely natural, but you know, he says he's going to, to kill them. And then Cass, you know, apropos of nothing, says, why do you get to decide? And and really, it's you know, that line is just there so that he can respond because I'm I'm the one with the power, you know, and that is of course again, you know, say it with me with great power, you know. So so yeah, the, he is the antithesis to Spider-Man. He is the evil Spider-Man, you know. Spider-Man is all about, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. He says, "I'm powerful, and because of that, I get to choose who lives or dies." You know, that is yeah, I I do appreciate that. And I, I, I haven't read very much Ezekiel Sims in the, in the comics. I don't know if that's his thing, but it's, I would be shocked if there was not at least one major Spider-Man villain in the comics who basically, who they gave that to, that reversal of the... Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the dream confrontation, the, the editing is... is quite obnoxious there. I really think that scene would have played much, much better if it just let it play out. And, see, and, and ultimately, like, the fact that it's a dream, you know, it, it doesn't really matter that the... yeah. Um... Hmm. And then, yeah, sh um, Cass is trying to wake up the three sleeping teenagers and that's again where it feels like okay this was this was written and directed by by women um yeah i'm not saying that fathers never struggle to wake up teenagers who are sleeping in and such but that very much felt like a you know the the mother of a teenager who's like okay you know what we're done here you are not sleeping another minute you know, she's like she turns on the radio and and like increases the volume and you know, turns on. I think she turns on the light. You know, there's there's various things, and the song that plays is I think we're a clone. Now. I mean, alone now, and it, yeah, let's do that. And yeah, uh, Maddie is like, what is this? Which yeah, that is that again. That feels like something a. <sighs> Yeah, um, yeah, it's this joke that, you know, like, Gen Z wouldn't, you know, appreciate, I think we're alone now, which is a, you know, a, an entertaining song, and, and definitely does, yeah, um, as you can probably guess, I'm pretty fond of the Weird Al parody, although, you know, sadly, he is you know, quite transphobic. Um, yeah, the scene of CPR directions really felt like it, it was it was pretty slow and, and bland and boring, and it, it's too bad because it kind of, there is a little bit of bonding going on there, and it's important, which is probably why it wasn't completely, like, if not cut entirely, at least trimmed down significantly, because it really is, like, we're not really... Yeah, it, it needed some... I think, you know, the, the Marvels recently did this, you know, yeah, this scene of, of young women bonding much, much better. In that, it was this montage of them, you know, yeah, practicing and, and eventually mastering. I think that would have worked well here. I think, you know... Yeah, one of the things is the CPR, you know, you could, yeah, you know, have, have some, some different things that they can do to, to practice, and you get little fun character moments where they're encouraging each other and, and you know, starting to, to warm more up to each other. But as it is, just the scene of, of them, you know, doing CPR 
and then you know finally moving on to the next thing like because I get it you know it's there because later they perform CPR on her but it just yeah I believe I have said everything right and then the yeah um, Cass goes to Peru and you know has Ben take care of the three of them I want to do a TED talk for Hollywood writers with just a short list of things to never ever ever under any circumstances ever again put into a movie script ever and one of those things is recognizing a location from a picture that in no way should still so accurately reflect what it actually are we seriously supposed to believe that in 30 years this this like tree you know the part of the tree would look that similar like just have something yeah it's just it's so ridiculous you know the, the guy I watched with my friend that I watched it with suggested why not just have it be that you know she we see her land you know not personally flying the plane but she you know the plane lands she steps out and we see him you know someone watching her and he approaches her and it's like I knew your mother kind of thing you know but why does she has why does she have to go to the the rainforest herself and this whole yeah and yeah it really felt like originally that chunk of the movie was was much much longer a much bigger part uh, you know the the um, it reminds me somewhat of the uh the the second maleficent movie um I th let's see so the it, yeah maleficent mistress of evil you know where the the yeah the exploration of the the I don't know if I want to give away exactly yeah let's just say there's a there's a location where we learn some stuff about you know an important element of the the Maleficent films and and yeah you know they're like they actually delve into stuff and then in this movie it's just kind of there you know like he he dumps a bunch of information on her and we the audience have to sit through like i appreciate it wasn't the exact same thing but there really wasn't a reason why it couldn't have just that that could easily have been the only time we see that honestly i think if the first time we even learn that cass the cassie's mother died in childbirth if that was at the baby shower, so we're learning it when Mary Parker and the other members of the baby shower learn, I think that would have made that scene even better than it already was, you know. And, yeah, we learn, you know, the reason Sims keeps seeing his death is he stole the spider and was cursed. And, and yeah, finally we get the theme you know, why did you hate me so much, Mom? Let's see. And... Yeah, we have the thing about, you know, um, Constance Webb was looking for the cure for this neuromuscular disease which the the you know yeah Cass would have had if not for her mother and you know and that is basically what she's dealing with at the very end of the movie and that's I believe also what she has in the comics uh, yeah, and then she's able to hug the spirit of her mother, and it's, uh, yeah. A again, like, this would have been, like, because mothers and daughters have a bond, you know, I I understand from, from reading that, you know, just is not quite the same 
for you know mothers and sons maybe also not for fathers and sons I, I think it is basically unique to the mother daughter situation and and yeah you know that's something they're trying to get into here but again like the movie the movie barely is about Constance or Cassandra's relationship with with Constance or what relationship how how she feels about Constance and let's see yeah and and you have the the thing of you know yeah great power is mentioned again yeah i th i think it was you know with was it with responsibility will come great power or something like that so yeah and <laughs> yeah um ben is trying to be understanding and he really can't keep these three teenage girls from you know <laughs> making a mess of, of the, you know, yeah. And and that, again, you know, feels like something that was written by women who, you know, either were, you know, like that when they were teenagers or, like, knew some that were or know some that are. And, yeah, the, the water broke. And I will definitely say, the you know, birth is a significantly better reason to stop hiding than, you know, toxic men and toxic men. And let's see. Um, then we have the... Yeah, um... Very clearly, Sims does not have anything resembling a spidey sense, much like the movie doesn't have a lot of sense. And he throws something that I guess is supposed to evoke a pumpkin bomb. And, and then, you know, Sims rises and there's fire again, Terminator. And there's a, a chase, and uh, you know, in, in city streets, yeah. And then we finally get to the fireworks payoff. I wonder how many people outright forgot that. Like, I at that point, I had basically just accepted, okay, it's just not coming back. No, the movie is never going to bring back up the fact that there were fireworks in that building. And... Let's see. Yeah, so they're creating a, a death trap for Sims. And yeah, the climax feels rushed, much like Venom 1 and Morbius. Not really Venom 2. So it's not every single time that they make this mistake. And and yeah, you know, setting up a trap for the for the villain who's who's more powerful, again, very very terminator. And near the very, very end, finally, Maddie's ability to skateboard actually pays off. Like, up to that point, it's just been a case of her being annoying. Like, she's, you know, she's holding, she, she's, like, the one way Cassandra can get her off the train is by taking the skateboard. And that, again, feels like, you know, a, the, a, a studio you know, person, there was an executive note that said, like, you know, kids like skateboarding, put skateboarding in the movie, and they scrambled to try to put in some, again, remove the skateboard and you're fine. It doesn't actually hurt the, the movie. And let's see. You know, because, like, it's especially, like, because Maddie's family is rich like it doesn't she doesn't need this particular skateboard I guess maybe it has sentimental value although the movie I don't unless I missed something doesn't explain that again like just have it be something 
that actually means like imagine if instead it was like oh Julia always wears this like uh, um, the specific earring and you know one of the others is like you know oh can I can I try it and she gets really upset and we learn oh you know that was actually her mother's you know it's it's the only thing she has that her mother gave her you know so, something like that or or maybe it's the first piece of jewelry her mother ever gave her so it has significant value or something but the skateboard it's just a, it's the skateboard you know it's there's not and she's not actually struggling with with money that's also like i i don't love that it kind of like it doesn't really underline how different the lives of Anya and Maddie are you know Anya who lives you know it's a teenager living by herself you know her father was deported she's keeping it secret because she doesn't want to get evicted she's really struggling to make rent and then Maddie who like there's not really anything you know yeah she doesn't need money and, and ultimately like essentially it's just that the movie wants for for the for it to end up with Cassandra being like the adoptive mother of the three, so all three of them need to be in a situation that they can't really return to or don't need to return to. It's not beneficial for them to return to, kind of thing. Yeah, again, they might as well have just been siblings. You know, the if the three of them were sisters, we would have had an easier time connecting because their trauma would be shared instead of going off in in different directions like the they have almost nothing in common they're you know they're teenage girls who don't want to go home you know Anya is the only one who doesn't I forget what they said about her mother but they specifically say that her father and certainly she doesn't mention that her mother would miss her so I guess maybe there's also something there you know Maddie yeah her parents don't miss her she she doesn't think at least and and Julia yeah you know her her mother's in the in the institution her father lives with his new family and they don't really want Julia there you know these are these are very different traumas and I think that might be about yeah um let's see yeah so so by the very end you know Cassandra is much more similar to the comic you know they cover her eyes with this like white film kind of thing she's in a wheelchair and yeah let's see and and the we get a little bit more at the at the very very end of of the yeah Julia Anya and Maddie in their suits we even see Cassandra and hers not a big fan of Cassandra's the other three look great I um I quite appreciate when you know Nando V movies in the video which again link down below make sure you watch it he pointed out you know there's maybe ten seconds of each of these young women in the actual costume and, and doing superhero stuff and again it's like no one wants this you know no one no one goes to one of these movies hoping ah oh, I hope there's about 10 seconds of, of the character if you can't put the character in the costume for more than 10 seconds don't put the character in the movie you know it doesn't like it just makes us frustrated it makes us not want to watch the next thing you do and I think that is everything. So, so yeah, at the very end, we also see the, um, you know, yeah, um, Peter has been been born, and. Yeah, um, 
I did think it was it was kind of interesting this thing of you know so the villain is trying to kill these young women based on what he's confident they will become not for anything they have done or are currently doing bringing up the question of fate versus determinism and yeah I, I wish the movie did more with that and I think that is all that I have so I think yeah um that is it for this video hit me up in the comments let me know what is your favorite spider-man movie or spider-man related movie so far and what do you hope to see in the future and yes if you say if if you're hoping for more sony that's perfectly okay you know i'm i'm not going to go off on you or something if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. They suggest a video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spot of thoughts on a movie. I do a weekly video on an animated Star Wars episode. You know, I'm almost all the way done with Young Jedi Adventures. I do, and you know, after that, I am actually going to subject myself to both the Droids cartoon and the Ewoks cartoon. I also do a weekly video of a horror thing. Right now, I am doing Ash vs. Evil Dead. You know, I am in Season 1 of that. And I try to do a daily. It doesn't always work out to be every single day. But yeah, video on a piece of Marvel television. I am doing them all in the order that they originally aired. I am going to do Inhumans next. Yeah. And the... let's see... yeah. The uh, recent Living Thoughts videos, I think about very similar to this video. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, which was catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. And, yeah, until then, try not to get stuck in the web.